Today I want to start with a very uh, theological and perplexing question, and you saw, if you saw the bulletin in, on the board, you know what it is. How tall was Jesus? Anybody want to guess? Okay. Okay. You can't, can't, Google can't go wrong, right? Uh, well, it's a good question because uh, in the Bible there's only maybe one or two places where it even talks about Jesus' height. Uh, one, of course, when he was growing up, it says that he grew in wisdom and stature. But it doesn't say at that point how tall he was. But then we come to this passage today that Ron just read, and there's one verse there that you could make an argument and say that Jesus was short. Because it says, depending on how you translate it, that Zacchaeus came and wanted to see Jesus but could not because he was short, he being Jesus, so he climbed up into a tree to be able to see little Jesus. Now wait a minute. That just goes against everything you've been taught, right? That's, that's, uh, that's like all the Sunday school teachings and Bible school and all the preaching you ever heard was Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, right? That's what we've always heard. What they probably didn't tell you was that in the original Greek, it can be translated either way. It can be translated that Zacchaeus, because of the crowd, that he could not, because he, Zacchaeus, was small, could not see Jesus. Or it can be translated, actually, that because of the crowd, he, Jesus, was so small that Zacchaeus couldn't see him, so he had to climb in a tree to be able to see him. It can be translated either way. And since I'm doing the sermon today, I'm going to make a call. He, Jesus was short. Five, five, according to Adam. I, I didn't know that. But anyway, uh, it's, <clears throat> if that's not enough for you, understand this, that in the early Christian church, they were people who ridiculed the disciples for saying Jesus was the Messiah, simply because the Messiah would never be as short as Jesus was. And so... Jesus was probably short, probably as short as John Wesley or Napoleon. And we have this picture here of a man who comes in either way. Uh, we, we have a picture here of, of Zacchaeus who wants to get a look at Jesus, but because of the crowd, and depending on the translation, uh, you, you can kind of, <clears throat> it can kind of get confusion, but he was not able to see him. And so he climbs up into a tree. And Zacchaeus was not <clears throat> just a tax collector, which was, you know, they were despised in those days. He was a chief tax collector, which means he was the head of the tax collectors. He was one who worked for the government, took advantage, uh, supposedly, of people, and was very despised in society. And that is the very person that Jesus went to have dinner with. The only person that he went to have dinner with in Jericho. Jesus, of all people, chose to go the home of Zacchaeus. But not only that, but Zacchaeus was a rich man. He was very rich. And Luke, if you read Luke, Luke is not very nice to rich people. Most of the time he's saying things against rich people... But in this passage, it's a little different. It shows that Jesus is going to the home of a rich person. I think it's interesting that when we, have, uh, when we talk about sending missionaries to other countries and other places, we almost always send them and talk about going to places of the poorest of the poor. And the Bible does say a lot about helping the poor. But why is it that we never send missionaries to Hollywood? Why is it that we never send missionaries to places where people are rich and have wealth? They need Jesus too, don't they? Why is it, Jesus said that there would be a temptation for those that are rich and it's easier for someone to go through the eye of a needle, you know, 
than the rich person to make it to heaven, but still there was Jesus going to a rich person's house. And we might be tempted to say, as they were, what is Jesus doing? Why is Jesus spending time with this sinner? In Luke chapter 15, in case they forgot, Jesus will remind them of the stories that he told in Luke 15. He told about going and this fellow trying to save a dumb sheep that was lost. And he also talked about a worthless penny that someone tried to find. And he talked about a sinful young boy, a prodigal son. And then he turned to them and said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I come to call the sinner. And here in this place they accuse him. There they accuse him of hanging out with sinners. And in this one they say, here is Jesus who is a guest of a sinner. Now it was a big deal in those days to be someone's guest. Because they, when someone took you in the Jewish culture under their roof, they were doing so and by saying, I'm going to protect you and you're important to me and I'm important to you. We're going to sit at a table. And in the Jewish culture, when you sat at someone's table, it meant that you were friends. And so that was a big deal. They're saying, wait a minute. This Jesus is being a guest of a rich rascal, a Ferris, uh, really a, a tax collector who has taken advantage of so many people. And then Jesus does something amazing. He looks at them and says, after he says, I, I come not to call the righteous, and I'm uh, he says, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house. Wait a minute. Two things there. First of all, he calls Zacchaeus lost. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I come to, to seek and save that which is lost. Right off the bat, that might be a little strange for someone to hear to say, wait a minute. Who said I was lost? Lost is a pretty strong word to use, isn't it? I mean, maybe I've misappropriated funds a couple times, or maybe I've done people wrong, but lost? I, I'm rich. I'm, I'm uh, honored, and I'm all these things. But lost? That's a little overstatement, is it? But no, that's the, co the, to the coin, the, the term that Jesus used, lost. Now, second thing he says, today is salvation come to your house. And I thought it was interesting that Jesus said, I'm going to go to your house today. I'm going to have supper at your house. And you know, he invited himself. Zacchaeus didn't say, oh, why don't you come over and you know, when it's convenient, we'll have dinner. No, nope. Jesus does it. Now, how, how would you like that today if as I, as your pastor, just said, by the way, I'm coming to your house today for dinner. Some of you might say, well, I won't be there, or uh, you bring your own dinner or whatever, you know. But if I invited myself and said, I'm coming to your house for dinner, some of you might not like that. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He invited himself. And you know, based on this, I want to I give you a definition of salvation. Salvation is when Jesus invades your space and sits at your table for a love feast and a salvation feast. When Jesus goes to the sinner and says, I am going to be with you, and I'm going to fellowship with you, that's salvation. And he sits down at the worst of the worst. Remember this, that Jesus, when he had the, uh, the feast, the Last Supper, and sat around that table with his friends, one of those was Judas. One of those that he knew would betray him. He still sat with him. And they would say, oh, he goes to... He's a friend of sinners, and he eats with sinners, and he's a guest of this worst sinner here. But Jesus said, today salvation has come to your house. You know, oftentimes in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus was not always invited. He came and he offered himself to people who didn't even ask. And that's kind of the way Jesus was known to do and still does today. Bible, the Bible says, <coughs> he said, you didn't choose me, but I have chosen you. God is looking for you. We are the lost sheep. We don't even have enough sense sometimes to know that we need God. And yet he's out there looking for us. And he's walking the hills searching for the one lost sheep. And that's exactly why they hated Jesus. 
They hated Jesus because he went to the rich and because he hung out with the sinners and he was with the disgusted and the poor and the rich. And that's one of the reasons they crucified him. That was the condensation of Jesus. How tall was Jesus? Well, he was small enough to reach down and grab the lowest of the low. The old song we used to sing, when he reached way down for me, he reached way down for me. I was lost and undone without God and his son, but he reached down his hand for me. Garth Brooks said, I've got friends in low places. Well, Jesus does too, I'll just tell you. He's got some friends in low places, and I'm one of them. Thank God that he left heaven. And he didn't say, I don't want that old worthless piece of dirt that nobody else has nothing to do. Thank God he looked at me and said, I'm going to save you regardless of yourself. I'm going to save you even though nobody expects me to do it. And some of the greatest surprises of heaven will be when you and I stand there and people will say, boy, I didn't think you'd make it. And I'd say, oh, I didn't think you would either. But, you know, <laughs> that's going to be wonderful. That's going to be wonderful because I know God loves more than we could even imagine. Aren't you glad that you're not the judge and I'm not the judge? Because there's a lot of people I wouldn't let in. There's some people I probably wouldn't let in. Aren't you glad that today that we stand before God and we stand before Him and today we know that He is the God of all creation and He's the one we stand before? Yes. And He says, today salvation has come to your house. What does it mean to be lost? I'm trying to explain that to the children. That's not easy. It's not easy now. You know, I remember being a child and my mom standing up in church and prayer requests and saying, pray for my husband, he's lost. And I just thought he was out there in the woods somewhere. I didn't know what she was talking about. But I, I understand a little bit more now. A fellow said one time, uh, he was a farmer, and said, you know, how did your cow get lost? And he said, well, it just eats a little tuff of grass and eats that and moves on to the next tuff of grass and maybe finds a weak spot in the fence or a loose spot and goes to the next tuff of grass. Before you know it, he's wandered so far, he's, he's lost. Sometimes that's what happens to us. We just wander so far away from God. Before we realize it, we're completely out of God's will. We don't even know how it happened. We're just kind of like that. I used to ha uh, have a pet raccoon, uh, raccoon when I was growing up. They don't make the best pets. Uh, they, after a certain age, they, they kind of change a little bit, and they're not, uh, they're not really good to have as pets because they will bite you hard, and it will bring blood, and they did. And uh, I finally took that pet to the stockyard and sold it to the first person who would give me anything for it. But pet raccoons, I was, I was reading about this guy who was a zookeeper, and he saw this little girl. Julie, who had a pet raccoon, he, and he told her about the dangers of raccoons and how they change and things. And she said, oh, no, Charlie won't bite me. He loves me. He would never do that to me. And then later on, uh, Julie had to have plastic surgery because this pet had, went, had disfigured her face so much. True story. But I, thought, I tell that to say this today, that we sometimes play with sin to the same way that we feel like that there's no big deal that it won't affect us and it won't hurt us. And, and I can tell you, I, I talked to a lady the other day when, you know, that, that had had an accident, car wreck. Doctor gave her uh, some pain pills. The next thing you know, she's hooked on pills and her life is a mess and she's destroyed her life. It happens. But none of us think that. I, I, I preach that message and I, I repeat today the three things that sin does. Let's see, see if you can remember these. First of all, sin will take you farther than you want to go. Secondly, sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And third, sin will cost you more than you want to pay. It's real and it's serious. And sometimes we, we think, well, I'll, just, I'll do this for a little while, but it gets a hold of us. And it destroys us. And that's why we need Jesus. Because he redeems us. And he buys us back. And we all need Jesus. Jesus wants to come to our house today. And he don't care who we are or what we've done. He wants to dine with us today. And he wants to abide. We're going to have communion a little bit. And have communion and d dine with Jesus. But would you say yes to Jesus today? 
You know, sometimes we let all kinds of things get in our way and cause us to be confused. And sometimes the worst thing that can happen to us is religion. Because we get caught up in what everybody else thinks and what everybody else thinks we ought to do. And I've seen the biggest thing that caused Jesus' problem. You know who it was that objected to Jesus going to the house of this rich man? It wasn't the sinner. It wasn't. It was the religious people. And most of the trouble I have when I'm visiting at the hospital or a pastor, most of the trouble I find is not the sinner, it's the religious people. Because they're so caught up in their own doctrine and religion that they have no room for Jesus. Let's just throw all that out. Somebody said one time, I used to be a Baptist, and they're like, how can you preach in a Methodist church when you were a Baptist? And I said, well, I preached the same Jesus I preached back then. He hasn't changed. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so today, Jesus wants to come to your house. And want to invite the musicians to come up at this time. And today, the invitation is for you. None of us are perfect. But yet, God wants to have a relationship with us. And he wants us to make a commitment to him. And say, I want to follow you. I want to live for you. And I invite you to do that today. As we sing, we're going to give you an opportunity to come forward. And you don't have to come up here to be saved. I know that. Or even to get right with God. Maybe, you've, maybe you're like the, the cow that wandered away. from the. You just need to come back home. But what this does, it lets everyone know that you're serious, that you need prayer today. Whatever it is, you can come up and shake our hand and go right back if you want. By that, the people will know that you're wanting us to pray for you. I don't embarrass anybody, don't call your name out. But if you want to come up and just be just ask to let this church know you want to be prayed for while we sing, we invite you to come. <clears throat>